If this is your first time on the channel, hi, my name is Alex Temes. I've been day trading for over 10 and a half years and I've made over $8.7 million trading and will pop up my broker statements on the screen right now. So a few weeks ago, I was invited to the restricted section of the Kennedy Space Center to meet with Rick, the CEO of Starfighters, which is an aerospace company that's privately held. The reason why this was so special is Starfighters is a direct competitor to SpaceX, who's owned by Elon Musk, and Blue Origin that's owned by Jeff Bezos. Now they do a couple things the same and a couple things differently. What they do the same is you know how Elon Musk's rockets go up and come back down? Well, with Starfighters, they use fighter jets to go send payloads up into space and those same jets come back down. The difference is that with Starfighters, they have a more efficient process. Rather than taking a giant rocket up into space and bringing it back, they use smaller, more efficient aircrafts to take smaller payloads faster. So whereas SpaceX and Blue Origin are bigger payloads, slower and more expensive, Starfighters is smaller payloads, but many, many times because it's so cheap and the aircraft itself comes all the way back down. The reason why this video is so special is because I got a first-hand look of their operations inside the Kennedy Space Center. After speaking to Rick and seeing their operations, I asked them if I was able to invest in the business. Now, they're a privately held company, so you can't just buy stock in the market. You have to be approved to buy a piece of this company. So I loved it so much that I invested $25,000 of my own money and I asked Rick if he'd allow you guys to invest as well. Now, they plan on going public through an IPO later next year. So if all goes well, they should be one of the few publicly listed aerospace companies in the entire market. As you know, Blue Origin is worth billions of dollars. SpaceX is worth billions of dollars and Starfighters is only worth a couple million dollars. So I think that there's a lot of upside and that's why I put my money where my mouth is. So if you like what you hear on this interview and if you're interested yourself in investing in Starfighters, Rick said he would let our audience invest before they IPO through a private deal. Like I said, I've invested $25,000 myself. So check out the link below in the description and hopefully I'll have more opportunities like this for you guys. In the meantime, enjoy the video. Rick, pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Uh, can you explain what we're doing here, what this whole operation is? We're Starfighters International. Starfighter Space is the parent company. And uh, what we are is a research and development operation utilizing F-104 aircraft to put space operational capability in low Earth orbit. Also part of our mission is to develop the hypersonic platform and utilizing rockets and test articles that will provide the information necessary for our Department of Defense. Yeah, it's impressive. I mean, how long have you been doing this? How'd you get into this whole industry? Well, we started this thing back in 1995. The aircraft uh, was always a favorite aircraft of mine. And we ended up accumulating initially three aircraft. The young lady over there with the F 104s on the back of her shirt. <laughs> yeah. That's what we were. We were a demonstration team. We flew all over the country. We were sought after by, by most of the military bases to come in, and, and we did that for 20 years flying air shows. While we were doing the air shows, we were I um, brought it over here in 2007 to start doing vetting flights for NASA. When we started doing contract work, we were obviously a hit because the aircraft's capable performance. So you're a pilot by nature, essentially. I've, I've been a pilot since I was 17 years old. So. Got it. And what was it like to pilot one of these? It's a really unique experience. The aircraft is Mach 2 Plus, and that's twice plus the speed of sound. This is the S model aircraft. This was, uh, of the F-104s, it was the latest production model, built in 1983, upgraded in 2002. The engines inside of these aircraft, as you can see, <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, turned it into the nickname of the manned missile. Yeah, Because wow. you're literally sitting on an engine and fuel. That's basically wow. what you've got. The afterburner section, the whole front end is uh, the different compression stages for the actual aircraft. So what is this gonna be currently used for? This is the engine for the airplane. Got it, so this is actually going into yeah. the airplane. Yeah, there's one in there right now. This yeah. is a, a backup engine for the aircraft. Got it, got it. Wow. And what this does obviously is propels us to speeds that most equipment does not have capable. Got it. Uniquely, um, the Air Force doesn't have hardly anything in the Mach 2 anymore because there wasn't a need for it. Now, ironically enough, we're flying aircraft that are older aircraft 
but have the higher speed capability, which they deemed wasn't necessary for operational fighters because of the high de development of the, of the missile systems that they have now, Got it. Um, where they can guide them where they need them to go. They didn't need speeds in excess of 1.5 or 1.6. So these airplanes are unique from that standpoint. And we get the last ones that were completely redone between 99 and 2002. We are operating those now exclusively, as you can see, both of these aircraft, that's a two seater, clearly, yeah. and, um, and the single seater, which has a little bit bigger engine, more fuel because you don't lose it from the back seat. But again, back to the idea of flying these things, it's, it's great. It's like uh, jumping into an IndyCar. High performance. Unique. Maneuverability is probably incredible. Uh, you know, it rolls very fast, 720 yeah. degrees a second. It takes a bigger area to turn because you notice the wings are only seven feet long. The wing on this aircraft is, you can literally catch a steak with them. It's very, very sharp and Aerodynamics has a lot to do with lift and drag and and um, various things. And this is one of the areas we don't have a lot of, it's called drag. Aircraft typically have thicker wings. This has got a very thin wing, so you, it accelerates extremely fast. Got it. And for what we're doing now, our missions, we're capable of carrying payloads at that Mach 2 speed, which is not only unique, but it also gives us the opportunity to carry test articles, rocket that can be used for this developments of space launch of small sat satellites, as well as hypersonic development. What does one of these engines go for here? They're about a million and a half dollars. Again, Again we could put that on eBay or anything or no? <laughs> no? Well, most people probably wouldn't know what to do with it if they had yeah. <laughs> it. put this in the back of your sedan. I yeah. mean, you'd get down the road pretty quick. <laughs> this has got a, a four stage afterburner, basically the whole back section from here back is uh, called an afterburner. And you probably all heard of afterburners. You see the glow yeah. in fighters and, and the flames shoot out about 12 feet out the back of the aircraft, <laughs> out the back of it. What happens is inside there, the afterburner section, there's rows of like literally sprinklers. And when I say four stage, it means there's four rows. So as the hot exhaust comes off the back side of the engine, these rings light up based upon the angle of the throttle as you're pushing it forward. And when you're going to the afterburner section, and as you push it forward, various rings light up, up to the full max yeah. afterburner or stage four. And obviously more fuel is being dumped on this hot exhaust. So it literally causes an explosion and pushes it out. These are what's called turkey feathers. And they open up as the extra thrust comes in. So this will actually open up like this because it's saying, hey, I can't contain this anymore. I got to open it all the way wow. up. And as it opens up, you've got massive amount of fuel being dumped in. So your fuel goes by really quick when you, when you light the afterburners. But with regards to capability of the aircraft, it's again, very unique in the fact that we go very fast, very quickly. And for the needs of our country, DOD realizes that obviously dollars and cents are important. So we're able to operate with smaller articles because of the increased speed. So it doesn't need the additional speed to get there. And that's kind of our mission to be at Mach 2 at 40,000 feet. We can do that with this aircraft all day long. Everything sounds like, you know your stuff in terms of rockets and you know the technology, but my question is, how are you able to find and attract talent to be able to use these massive ideas and turn them into a reality? Because talent acquisition is tough, and especially in this competitive industry with SpaceX, Boeing, and everyone else out there, how do you find and retain talent? Fighter pilots coming out of the military, well, these guys are very easy uh, candidates to be able to put into these aircraft. Guys have been flying F-15s, F-16s, F-22s, these kind of things. Yeah, They can step into these things pretty quickly. Very versed in the high performance business, and. Yeah. This is just a little bit uh, different makeup on the aircraft, and it's just a matter of learning where the corners are. Sure. Um, we've had several test pilots that we've trained that have come through here, and the guys are amazingly fast in how they can adapt to the small little wings and high performance um, um, basis on the aircraft. So pilot-wise, it's, it's not really that horribly difficult to get good people that can mm -hmm. do the job. Uh, maintenance, you know, again, guys coming out of the military, yeah. uh, fit in real well. Our, our crew, which is full-time, we're not a part-time group that the guy comes in and changes the tires on Saturday or Sunday. We're full-time. The guys are here every day. Continuous work on the aircraft, even if you're not flying them, there's always maintenance yeah. items to be done. And where, how does the payload get attached? Or how does that work? There are pylons, and uh, this is what goes under wing, about middle of the wing of the aircraft. And as you can see, 
there's no tip tanks on this single seater. About the middle of the wing, there's, there's an attachment point where this basically attaches to the wing and the payload sits underneath here. Wow. Wow. So that's how we actually carry or deploy um, whatever payload we're carrying. What are some wow. of the challenges that you face bringing this technology onto the market? And how have you kind of passed through that? Well, the biggest thing is just uh, making ourselves known that we're available for it. Uh, yeah. Once they find out that we have Mach 2 capability and obviously the capability of, of the airspace element operating on a Kennedy Space Center kind of sells itself. Yeah. We're kind of hidden here because we were, we were always doing just pilot training. We weren't putting ourselves out necessarily for research and development. Now we are. And now that we are, we've had large groups as yesterday. We had DOD here with a very large group of people Again, they know about us now, and they wanted to see in touch and obviously see that it is a real yeah, there's functioning operation. Everything is here. Yeah, yeah. Everything, is, everything is capable of, of everything we say, We've, and we have documentation with that. We have contracts now with General Electric Aerospace. Yeah. We're now out in the market, and obviously yeah. word spreads fast because there's no sustained Mach 2 capability pretty much out That's there. That's the right most now. impressive thing is the speeds are just yes. amazing. So the main thing that people don't know here, guys, is that NASA essentially owns everything here and companies like Starfighters, Boeing, SpaceX, all lease their areas from NASA. And it's actually crazy because this entire facility is probably about 50,000 square feet. And after talking to Rick, what he's actually doing is he's building a 100,000 square foot warehouse to house even more of these. So. Pretty much all of the planes you see here until the black plane are gonna be moved to Texas to then put in a bunch more new planes. So it's pretty impressive what they're doing here. Do you have any partnerships with other aerospace companies or any types of goals or missions to maybe do some sort of joint missions together or anything like that you're thinking of? Possibly. Um, big thing for us right now is dealing with what we already have in our hands because it's a daunting task to make yeah. these things functional. Like I said, some of the pylons have been redesigned. We have some things that I can't show you in the office. Is there ever a uh, a blueprint or a roadmap to go even faster than Mach 2? Like, There's really not much out there that'll do that. Uh, the aircraft will do about Mach 2.4. Got it. I mean, which is, you know, very, very fast. You start getting into those things, it, it becomes, uh, now you're talking about big, big dollars to find equipment that, that'll do those kind of speeds. And is that considered hypersonic or what is that considered? Hypersonic is at Mach 5 and above. Mach 5 and above. Mach 2 gets changes the elements. Again, the rocket size goes down the faster you get it closer to that Mach 5 yeah. arena. And approximately, for the people that don't know how fast Mach 2 is, what is that approximately in oh, terms 1400 of... 1,400 miles an hour. 1,400 miles an hour. We're capable of right at the 1,500 mile range. Yeah. And Mach so. 5 essentially would be like 3,500 miles yeah. an hour, essentially. Yeah, yeah, in that area. And a commercial airline goes, what, 500 miles an hour, let's exactly. say? Exactly. Yeah, you're running a, anywhere from 0 0.8 to 0 0.85, 88 at yeah. the most. That's, yeah. that's pretty much standard. And in these single seaters going Mach 2, Mach 2.5, how long do they have until the fuel runs out? The single seater obviously has more fuel. It's, it's capable of operations depending upon what the requirement is. The profile gives you about an hour reaching Mach 2 for probably 25 minutes, but that's at altitude. Um, yes. When you get to altitude, your fuel consumption is much lower, even, in, even though you're an afterburner, because it's a fuel air mixture. Mm -hmm. So the more air there is, obviously more, more fuel is being added to it. So lower altitude, you burn a lot more gas. And if you go high, Again, it's the fuel air mixture. The, the uniqueness of what we have is we can do for small companies very quickly. And uh, obviously it's a much bigger challenge to put a big rocket yeah. into orbit. And, and more expensive. And much more expensive and time consuming because you know, even though Elon has just totally changed the industry and he's obviously a mega genius, yeah. what his crew has done over there is nothing less than ama amazing. Yeah. I mean, they've. They put together some pretty unique things and um, capability is, is unmatched. You know, we don't, we don't compete in that arena. Yeah, it's a different ball game. It totally different for us. His interest isn't in what we do. And obviously ours is certainly not in, in what he does. What's amazing to me is you've been a pilot for a very, very long time. So you went from being a pilot to upgrading to all this. My question is, how do you stay inspired to make sure that you keep pushing forward towards that vision and that mission every day? Because with, all the crazy stuff happening in the world, it's kind of tough to lose 
that balance loose track. So how do you stay inspired? And it's easy to lose perspective, but at the same time, um, each time a new challenge comes up, you know, to a typical fighter pilot, they, they love the challenge. Yeah. And I do too. I love space. I've always been a yeah. big advocate of everything in, in space. I think um, opportunities for our humanity is, yeah. is still outside of our, our globe and certainly capabilities that we can provide to our people on on the earth are um, huge and I feel very excited about the fact that we can add to that that yeah. um, capability the general people get to utilize. Small companies that normally could never have had a satellite, even if they could afford it, they couldn't get yeah. the time to get it there because they can only launch so many rockets. Correct. You know, I mean, even even the best of them like SpaceX or NASA, they, you know, there's only so much they can get up. Big challenge to put a big rocket in orbit. Yeah. Much easier for us. And yeah. As Elon's done with his boosters that can come back, which is amazing. We have the first stage, which is the aircraft. So that comes back. So again, it's a cost reduction capability for these small companies that say, hey, we'd love to get our phone satellite array yep. put in orbit. We can do that. It's not even work for you. This is something that you're passionate about, no, that absolutely. you love, and you see a absolutely. very big picture for. And that's what kind of keeps you going is your love and passion. Like, I mean, I love space too. Like. My wife tells me all the time, I'm never allowed to go into space, but I'm saving up. I got money on the side. I'm waiting to go. I'll try to build a hotel on the moon if I can. But uh, because it's so so much like a passion and a hobby, I love learning about it. I love reading about it. I love being surrounded by it. So to me, it's almost the same for you. Is This is not work. This is almost a playground where you can make your dreams come true. Sure. Uh, it is. And we're, we feel very fortunate that we're putting ourselves in this, this uh, arena. We are actually in the process of getting ready to do our first launches. Um, this is all, all brand new. Okay. Um, we've designed the pylons and everything, and we have the mock-up vehicles that we are currently testing in captive carry. We've, we've done that now multiple times. The next step is to actually launch them. So there's a lot of different steps you have to do to move to these this levels, and it takes a long time. So it's difficult for somebody just saying, hey, I'm ready to go, you know, throw that thing on me and go. It doesn't work that way. It, yeah. It's a lot of- If well, only it was that easy, right? Yeah, exactly. A lot of bureaucracy involved. Yeah, I could imagine. So last question for you, Rick, sure. is if you were to go back in time as someone that is interested in aerospace and interested in this entire world, what advice would you give young Rick or young Alex that loves space, loves exploration, that wants to get into this industry? What would you tell that person? Well, a lot of opportunities right now. Space is gonna be more and more part of our lives than what it has been in the past. Before it was just a select few that actually got to be involved yeah. in the space network is slowly starting to grow. Well, we're kind of the pioneers with our type of operation within this, this structure. And that was partly because the space shuttle was going away and they wanted to help develop the commercial side of, of space for some of the things we've already been talking about. So we happen to be one of the first ones in on this, this game. I would say if somebody's interested, make sure you take courses um, that can best age you. Obviously, psychology and sociology aren't the best things to take. You want to take aerodynamics, all the other things necessary that can teach you about what space is and what it's about. And you want to be an aerospace engineer, engineering, yeah. a huge thing, math. I'm a big proponent of, of people that want to get into the future, not to take courses that aren't really going to enable you to, if you want the space world, to, to excel within that world. Uh, so you want to take courses that are basically the STEM programs. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, I'm a big advocate of that. I think that's important for kids to determine what, what's important to them or where they want to go. Um, and I would definitely direct everybody to go into the, um, those arenas. Got it. So if you put in the work, you put in the time, the opportunities are there. Absolutely. Got it. Rick, appreciate it. Thank you for your time today. We had a great time. All right. All right, guys, we just finished up with Starfighters here. Had an awesome conversation with Rick. We saw the entire operation here, how he started it, what his goals are, what the future looks like, and how they're probably going to take over the aerospace industry. So. This is just an unbelievable, incredible experience. We'll throw some photos on the screen of going actually inside one of these fighter pilots, which is crazy.